reason I am the way I am is because I've had a thousand of those experiences. Bible school didn't make me who I am. Taking some theology classes and some Greek classes didn't make me who I am. It's a thousand experiences with God that I saw God do this and I saw God do that and I saw it miraculously change and I saw things move that nobody could make move and I saw God deliver people that nobody ever thought would be delivered and I saw it over and over and over again and so I get to this place in my life and nobody's gonna talk me out of what I've seen God do. If you study the history of Israel in the Old Testament, they had good leaders and they had bad leaders. But their worst leader was a guy named Ahab, who was married to a woman named Jezebel, who took the entire nation away from the worship of God and introduced Baal worship, idol worship. And so you have a nation now going astray, but God's got one guy name Elijah and he is a bad man okay and Elijah looked at the king and said it's not gonna rain again until I say it's gonna rain and he said all right let's end this thing he said meet me at Mount Carmel he said and we're going to build an altar and the God who answers by fire let him be God so they build their altar the prophets of Baal and they call on God day and night Nothing happens. In fact, actually, Elijah makes fun of him. He said, maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to holler louder. He's over there drinking a Coke, making fun of him because he knows that there is no Baal God. And then finally, we pick up to where Elijah comes forward. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So the people came near to him, and <clears throat> this is very important. I probably won't get here, but I will, I'll try. And he repaired the altar. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. It is hard to have the fire of God fall if there's no altar anywhere. And we want to see where is God? Why isn't God doing this? Why didn't God do that? I, I hear about signs. I hear about wonders. I hear about miracles. I hear about healings. I hear about a, why isn't God doing it? Well, it's hard for the fire of God to fall when there's no prayers at the altar going up. So what did he do? He rebuilt what they had abandoned that was broken down. Next verse, verse 31, I'm gonna read all the way through verse 40, straight through. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of, again, order, protocol, rebuild the altar that has been broken down. Take 12 stones according to the 12 tribes, uh, 12 tribes of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name, verse 32. Then with the same stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the large altar, enough to hold two shays of seed. Next verse. And he put the wood in order. Twelve stones according to twelve tribes, rebuilding what's been torn down, an order of the wood. Cut the bull into pieces. There's the first thing, then there's the second thing. Laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water. Now remember, it hadn't rained in three years. They're in a drought. Water's the most precious thing on the planet because Elijah won't let it rain. So he's saying, take all this drinking water and pour it all over the sacrifice. Fill the water pots with water. Pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Next verse. Then he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Next verse. So the water ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. Verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering. See, there's a time now. Hmm. You do this, 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 and then there's a door open. And then you got to move in that moment. Okay? The opportunity of a lifetime only exists during the lifetime of the opportunity. The order created an opening so much here I, so much 
at the time of the offering until the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done these things at your word. I did, I did it your way. We're not just doing it any old way. Well, I like to worship God according to my personality. God, I came to you your way. You don't get to come to God the way you want to. You follow his protocols to get his results. If you want God results, you got to do God things. Okay? And then I've done these things at your word. Next verse, please. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water. I mean, fire is burning water. The fire licked up the water that was in the trench. Verse 39. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Verse 40. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Do you know God in one moment killed a religion? A whole false religion of idol worship. God destroyed it in a moment. Now, there's a whole lot more here because after this, Elijah ran from his lot for his life. Okay? Sat under a juniper tree and prayed to die. So sometimes right after your greatest moments come your lowest moments. Ooh, there's so much to unpack right here. And why is he running? Because Jezebel hadn't touched him, but all she did was threaten. She said, if he's killed my prophets, then he'll be like this by this time tomorrow. And he took off running. The Jezebel spirit makes you run from threats. Even though the enemy can't touch you or do nothing to you, you're running from a threat. There's so much I could unpack right here. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this word. As we launch this series, change us forever. And everybody said amen to that. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go, here we go. Don't pay any attention to your watch, just let me do. My generation, and I'm going to say my father's and probably his father's, we only cared about what happened in this room. I didn't care about all that stuff. We had people parking in dirt. We had people parking in grass, parking in cow pastures. And I, it wasn't that I was insensitive. That just was not a priority to me. You know, having the most amazing children's ministry in the whole world was, that was not extremely important to me. I just want to make sure they were taken care of properly. But now, when it came to what was happening in this room, when most people tell you they seek God, you know, if they got to tell you how much they seek God, they're probably not seeking God. But it's hard to lie with my wife on the front row. In, in those early years, I had prayer days. I would study on Thursday to prepare. I do admin on Tuesday and Wednesday, Monday with my day off. I do admin and all my meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday. I'd have my uh, study day on Thursday. And Friday was a prayer day. I don't mean I prayed for an hour. I mean, I prayed for the day. And then after I would kind of tuck Hope in around 10-ish is when she likes to go to bed, on Saturday night, I would come in the sanctuary at 10 and nothing to pray till 4, 4.15, 4.30 in the morning. Go back, take a shower, drink a pot of coffee, and come back and preach probably five services. We didn't have a lot of structure. We just had a move. The building held 800 people. We would put 1,200 in it. I'd start my first service. They would say, there's 400 people standing outside, can't get in. I'd say, come back at 1130. I'd say, go out there and make an announcement. We had a bullhorn. Come back at 11.30. 11.30, building packed out, people standing around the back wall, and they say there's, there's hundreds of people out there. Tell them to come back at 1.30. I'd end up staying there 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. Then we started doing that on Saturday. Then we started doing it on Wednesday, and we did it on Saturday, and we did it on Sunday. 
just to get everybody in the room. They didn't care where they parked. They didn't care what kind of building it was. Our air conditioner could not bring the building down sometimes under 90 degrees. Running the air conditioners wide open. But the passion of the people and the size of the crowd and the activity that was going on in the room, the air conditioner could not cool the room. Okay? And that was all I cared about. That's what I was raised on. You got to understand, I came from poor people. I came from rural. They, they believed God for everything. You got to, it's, it's hard to connect with that because everybody, you know, we got our insurance and we go down and we let our insurance pay for it and we just get up, we own our dental plan and our eye plan and everything. We didn't have that. If we had a headache, God's going to heal it. If you had a migraine, God was going to have to heal it. If you didn't have no food, you prayed, and God sent somebody to drop some off. Y'all think I'm kidding. We live that way. And we saw God do all kind of crazy stuff. And you got to understand, the reason I am the way I am is because I've had a thousand of those experiences. Bible school didn't make me who I am. Taking some theology classes and some Greek classes didn't make me who I am. It's a thousand experiences with God that I saw God do this and I saw God do that and I saw it miraculously change and I saw things move that nobody could make move and I saw God deliver people that nobody ever thought would be delivered and I saw it over and over and over again and so I get to this place in my life and nobody's going to talk me out of what I've seen God do. But you are the salt of the earth, a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. When you forget about trying to change everybody else, and you say, I'm going to take the word and I'm going to change my world, then your world lights up. Then when you get around everybody else and they're depressed and you're full of joy, you stick out. What's going on in front of your eyes may seem small, but God has a much bigger plan in store. In this next chapter of On Assignment, Ron Carpenter will help you discover how to see God's true plan for your life. The blessing is not on him, the blessing is on you. And if you will obey, then I'll put this thing on you, and everywhere you go, you will carry it. You will walk in with it. Every room, everybody will recognize it. Blessed shall you be. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. You know, I never tire of the Word of God and I'm so grateful for the time we have together because we can take the bread, take the Word and get our daily bread from it. And anytime the Word of God is broken, our lives can be forever impacted and changed. I hope that happens every time that you tune in with us here at Ron Carpenter Television. I got to take a moment and do two things because I believe God always wants us to expand in our future, but I got to say thank you and stones of remembrance for where we are. We've just finished out a year, which has turned out to be one of our greatest years financially ever in history. And I just want to say thank you to you. I like I always say, you have many options. Man, there's some great, great ministries. Uh, out there. Many of them I know them personally. They're doing great things. They bring a great word and you have other places where you could sow your seed and I hope that you do. But we've been one of those where you have made that investment. My prayer is that you have seen a blessing that is a direct result of the sacrifices you made to bless Ron Carpenter Television. We endeavor to take the word of God unadulterated, uncompromised and unwatered down to as many people as we can in every nation that we can in every tongue that we can speak it for as long as we're here doing what we're doing. Thank you for in a big way or a small way for everyone who's helped us accomplish that. Now, I believe God wants our circle to enlarge. Those of you that have been giving, will you continue? 
Those of you that have just started giving, would you continue? And maybe those of you saying, you know what, this has blessed me and this is impacting my life. Would you do me a favor? Would you bless the thing that's blessing you? Would you feed the thing that's feeding you? And would you consider, whether by becoming a monthly partner or whether it's a one-time gift, would you consider this being your first time making an investment into the kingdom through Ron Carpenter Television? Why? Because we believe not only will God return it to you 30, 60, 100 fold, but we endeavor to take what's happening right here and put it in as many households, as many phones, as many computers, as many television sets as we can. Because wherever the word goes forth, a seed is planted and the word of God will not return void. Would you pray and ask God what he would have you to do? We believe this is a year of expansion and an open heaven, and I want you to be a part of it. Now, let's get back to the message and let's finish out and see what God's got to say today. When we came in that room, we had the pieces to the music. Terrence, you've been with me many years. You remember a lot of this. There's, it takes the right things to do it. You don't just do that. Now, let me help you. Because I think I'm laying the groundwork of what's to come. In those services, it was normal. No altar call. There hadn't been any preaching, but three people over there are getting healed. And this couple right here is hugging and crying. And they've been separated a year and a half. And he was a drunk. And he walked in off the street, sober. And God was, so he's healing somebody over there. A marriage is being restored here. And over here in that aisle, somebody's walking up the aisle throwing drug paraphernalia out of their pockets. And the steps are covered with needles and wrapping papers and all kind of stuff just all over the... Now, this is just going on while we're worshiping. There's nobody orchestrating anything. There's no altar workers at the altar. I'm not, I don't, I'm not on the stage preaching. There's been no altar call. And we've got eight or ten people that's ran to the floor and laid down because they want to be saved and nobody said anything about being saved. And see, what happened is people from all over a region who were tired of the frozen chosen church and they were tired of starchy services with no God, no miracles, no nothing. They would drive for hours to come to this place. It was multicultural. It was multiracial. It was multidenominational. And everything was coming together because there was a move of God. And people were getting up out of wheelchairs and demons were being cast out. Demons were being cast out. You've never seen demons cast out. It is not pretty. <laughs> Nobody does that anymore. We send them to counseling. You don't counsel a demon. Demons do not respond to medication. You cannot Xanax a demon. It has to be cast out. <laughs> And when something is irrational and crazy and won't leave and it's tormenting and it has somebody in bondage and they're insomniac and they're suicidal, that ain't always somebody that needs counseling. Sometimes you got to lay your hand on them and say, come out, come out, come out in the name of Jesus. And they walk out in their right mind and they hug their husband and go home. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not casting with you vision. I am casting vision with you. These are my experiences. <laughs> we had the drug dealer kingpin die. And their family wanted the church, the, the funeral at our church. I mean, if there was a drug went out in this city, it went through this person. I said, all right, we'll have it here. Man, they started, they came up, probably 2,000 people. I mean, every kind of everything in the world was walking in that building. Things I had never seen walking in that building. Okay? 
we put our praise and worship team on the stage and started singing, and everybody in the building started throwing up. Everybody from front to back started puking because of the conflict of two kingdoms colliding in one building, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And all of a sudden, their body didn't know how to respond. And our ushers were running around with trash cans. Now, some of y'all can't clap because you sound, I sound like I'm from a different planet. I'm here to tell you, this should not be uncommon. This should be happening every time we come together in God's house. That drug dealer's whole family got saved, delivered from drugs, and has been coming to our church ever since. <laughs> I mean, these people were hellions. These people were heathen. These people cared nothing for God. No respect for God or people. And God revolutionized all of them in a moment. This is what I cared about. This is what my generation cared about. But about 15 years ago, something shifted. I'm not totally sure what it was. Millennials catch too much heat as it is already. But it had a lot to do when, when the millennials began to come into leadership in the churches. Something shifted, and it shifted hard. And all of a sudden, this is what I started hearing over and over again from the next generation of preachers that were under me. I don't want to make God weird. The word weird, I've heard that word. I, thought, I, don't, want, I don't want God to be weird. I want to invite people in and it not be weird. Okay? So now we have pretty church and God is nowhere to be found. And the problem is we have a generation that has experienced such a small part of God, they don't know he's not there. That's what Samson did. Samson, they would tie him up and he'd break it. And he'd tie him up and he'd break it. And he'd go and said, I'm going to untie these ropes like every other time. And then one time he went and they didn't break. And one of the saddest statements in the Bible... Said, and Samson knew not that the Lord had departed. He was so unfamiliar with the presence of God, he didn't even know God wasn't there. And I go to these amazing church services with hope. And the production is unreal. I mean, Broadway level stuff. The children's building. Oh my gosh. And they meet you out in the road. <laughs> I you lattes. We got latte church now. <laughs> Everybody's got a t-shirt. Branding you. Oh, marketing savvy. Got all of our organizational flow chart. We got a system. And I'm sitting there in those services, and I look at Hope. I say, am I crazy? I said, Hope, I don't feel anything. I mean, I feel absolutely nothing. It's good. But nothing happened. They came in lost, and they left lost. They came in sick, and they left sick. They came in addicted, and they left addicted. They came in sad, and they left sad. They came in depressed, and they left it. Because... The anointing destroys the yoke. Not talent, not a production. And that tells me that we got a lot going on in the room, but there's no anointing in the room. People's lives don't change. Nobody knows the Bible. You know why nobody in our churches knows the Bible? Because their pastors don't know the Bible. 
I listened to them preach. And I'm like, have you guys ever even read your Bible? But they preach on the seven rules of a great relationship. The five things God would say to Kim Kardashian. <laughs> because nobody knows how to open the Bible and disciple the people. So we got to do all this other stuff. And then we're locked in a cycle. Because what you do to get them, you got to do to keep them. And so they look at a guy like me like, like a wrecking ball. And my, my invites to those places are going down. You know why? Because I go in and unleash chaos. And so we got a generation that's saying, you know what, Holy Spirit, we got this thing real good without you. Won't you just wait in the parking lot out there? This church is good. It's pretty. It's working really well. Our systems are doing good. Our volunteer base is really on point, and, and our music is, is really quality. And, you know, God, you just, you know, this, this, this throwing up stuff, casting out of, we don't want no casting out of, we don't want it to be, I'm inviting my cousin, and I don't want it to be weird. You know, I don't want to be so naive as to think that maybe everybody who's watching us, who's tuned in with us right now, has this great, you know, deep relationship with God. Maybe you're at a place of loss. Maybe you're at a place of bewilderment. Maybe you're at a place of questioning. Maybe you're just at a place where you know there's something, or may I say someone, that's missing in your life. His name is Jesus. If you'd like to accept him and make him Lord and Savior and him literally come and live on the inside of you, your sins be forgiven and your salvation purchased and you're on your way to heaven, that can happen with this one simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are God's son, raised from the dead on the third day. I believe you came to purchase my salvation. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior and ask you into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Save me now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer right, write in, call in, email us, do something. But we got to know because we want to celebrate with you the greatest decision you will ever make and hopefully many more good decisions will spring out of this one and until next time a big god bless you we'll see you real soon on ron carpenter television but you are the salt of the earth a city set on a hill a light that cannot be hidden when you forget about trying to change everybody else and you say i'm gonna take the word and i'm gonna change my world then your world lights up then when you get around everybody else and they're depressed and you're full of joy you stick out What's going on in front of your eyes may seem small, but God has a much bigger plan in store. In this next chapter of On Assignment, Ron Carpenter will help you discover how to see God's true plan for your life. The blessing is not on him, the blessing is on you. And if you will obey, then I'll put this thing on you, and everywhere you go, you will carry it. You will walk in with it. Every room, everybody will recognize it. Blessed shall you be. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.